Well, good morning, Central. How's everybody doing? Are you good? Oh, I hope you are. I hope you had a great first week. Um, and we are starting a brand new series called Jesus the Goat. Now, if you're probably, you know, over the age of 40, you might be offended at that. It's okay. Goat, of course, is an acronym for the greatest of all time. And so we're going to explore over these next four weeks using four stories in the life of Jesus that we actually believe Jesus truly was the greatest of all time. And today we're going to begin by explaining that. But, but we all understand this concept because if you are a Canadian sports fan right now, like it is a pretty good time to be a Canadian sports fan, isn't it? Bianca yesterday, come on. <laughs> Bianca beating Serena. I mean, that was epic. Wow, what a, what a, she held her off in that second uh, set. And so really excited for her. And of course, we had the Raptors win this year, national champions, you know, and that's great. Yeah, three of you like that. And... Uh, and then, of course, uh, many of you have met uh, my friend in the past, Sarah, and, and her partner, Melissa, in beach volleyball, are actually the world champions in beach volleyball. And so, yeah, it's a, great, it's a great time to be a Canadian sports fan. And the thing I love about it is that these people have come from all over the world. It's truly Canadian. I, Bianca was the best, hey? Yesterday, she was totally Canadian when she apologized for winning, right? She's like, I, I know you all came to see Serena win. I'm so sorry. You know, it's like... I, I, he doesn't get any more Canadian than that. That was awesome. But, but as great as those moments were, they don't define someone as the greatest of all time, right? To be the greatest of all time, you have to have a lot of work, a body and breadth of work, and you have to have some durability. You have to like, go beyond one generation to be considered the greatest of all time. And so, you know, maybe you're a basketball fan, and you might argue that Michael Jordan was the greatest of all time, or a hockey fan, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you're a music fan, and it's Miles Davis, if you love jazz, right? Or Beethoven, if you love classic. And if you're unfortunate enough to like country, Garth Brooks, I don't know what it is, but... Um, <laughs> Any Garth Brooks fans in the house? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Um, whether it's art, Michelangelo or Van Gogh, right? You, you, you become a specialist in an area for a long period of time, and you rise above everyone else, and so you get the title, the greatest of all time. So the question is, we started our experience together today with this premise that the only thing that is going to change the world legitimately is love. So if you think about that, who gets the title greatest of all time when it comes to love? And I would like to argue that it's Jesus. Because Jesus didn't just proclaim it. He didn't just preach it. He didn't just tell others to do it. He actually embodied it. And there's no greater demonstration of this than when he stretched out his arms and died on a cross for us because he loved us. Now I understand Maybe you're here and you have, had a, you have a bad taste in your mouth, and, and maybe rightfully so, because maybe you, you've looked at church history and we don't really have a great track record. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I wish I could too take an eraser to the history books and some of the times that people who claimed to follow his way, the way of love, have demonstrated actually the opposite. See, here, here's the problem, right? When you lose relationship, it just becomes about the rules, and we're always at our worst when that becomes our driving force. Or maybe you're here and you know somebody who claims to be a Christian or a follower of Jesus and they didn't act in a loving way at all. And so I understand you coming with a little bit of skepticism, maybe a little bit of hurt, maybe even some anger and bitterness towards Jesus. So you say, well, I don't believe he is the greatest of all time. But, but I, I want to just show you something really powerful today that the truth is that Jesus demonstrates something that no one else has demonstrated in a powerful way. And, and it's not just that he did these things that we can mimic. There was actually a thing behind the thing, as I'd like to say it. And, and so this week we came across an interview with John Mayer. And he says something about the guitar. I, I think he might be the greatest of all time when it comes to playing guitar. But he says something really profound that I'd actually like to take and apply to Jesus. And so let's watch that interview together really quick. I'm not a big advice guy because I feel a little bit like a misfit myself in my life. But if anybody was asking for advice on how to sort of find the promised land for themselves on the guitar, my advice might sound a little unfun. 
but it's that everything you learn, learn the thing that is the building block for the thing you just learned. And that might be scales, you know, instead of just parts of songs. Trace back why you like the thing and learn the thing that made the thing you like, and you will be five times better every time you do that. If you just learn my song, let's say I want to learn gravity, you know it's... And if all you learn is end, you don't have an understanding of the guitar. You have an understanding of gravity, right? What I've always done, and now what I try to suggest other people do, it was understand that that's part of a much larger scale that goes all the way across the neck. So it's not just, well, that's G, pentatonic. So you can, or it's really, I'm playing it sort of a major pentatonic, but. I can go. C, C, C. Um, see? So whatever you learn is the tip of the iceberg. Dive underwater and find the rest of the iceberg. And then you can always play with that vocabulary. So everything you learn, learn why, and then reverse engineer it and do it every time you want. I always learned a lick, I learned what the root was. What's the root? You can put the lick in any key. <laughs> I love that. First of all, because he's like, it's easy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're John Mayer, all right. I, I don't care how much you know about theory, you may never be able to play like that. But, but the second thing I like is actually the profound thing. It's the thing behind the thing that matters. And the reason why I think that Jesus is the greatest of all time is because not only did he show us the thing, but he is the thing behind the thing. God loves the world. God created a world for you and I not only to experience love, but to express love. It's why it's so ugly when we don't live to who we were created to be. And so God is love. This is the essence of who Jesus was and came to remind us about. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to tell us the first story in this four-week series. Um, and it's a story of a really unlikely hero. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. If you don't have your Bible today, that's okay. It will be on the screen. And I also want to remind you that you can download the Version app on your phone. It's a, it's a great app. Listen, if, if you're looking to dig a little bit deeper below the surface of just what you see, because listen, if you just look at the church or at Christianity or Christians, you may actually miss the thing behind the thing. And so Jesus is going to introduce us to that in this story. And so you can follow along and again mark it, because here's what I've learned about stories. You read it three times and you get three different things out of it. But here's what happened in the life of Jesus in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. We read, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, now if you're not familiar with that, that's okay. It was his home base. So Jesus traveled a lot. Uh, he would teach, uh, and he would heal people, and people would follow him, and then he would go home. And home is that safe place, right? That place you can retreat to. But on his way home, maybe to get some rest, maybe to be with his friends, he's encountered, he's confronted by someone, and the Bible says it's a centurion. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to you, but in that day, it meant a lot to Jesus. You see, the centurion was the enemy. The centurion was a part of the oppressive empire that through force had taken over the nation of Israel, killing, slaughtering, slaughtering literally hundreds, if not thousands of people. Jesus was not the only one to die on a cross. In one massacre, it said that over a thousand men were hung on a cross in a single day. They took slaves. They took the spoils of war. They heavily taxed the people. They were, they were, they were the enemy of the state. And, and this is really important because I want you to think of who is that person in your life that you hate. Maybe they hurt you. Maybe they took something from you. 
and you find yourself a captive to a circumstance or a situation that was not of your own choosing. Maybe it represents a people group or, or an organization that you're terrified is going to take over the world and you're afraid of them. They're an enemy. The incredible part of this story is that God's going to use an enemy to demonstrate the love of God. And so Jesus sees the centurion come to him and he asks for help. And here, here's the thing, you need to know that I don't know your story, I don't know where you find yourself, but I do know that there's a God who not only hears but answers anyone who asks genuinely for help. And so he says, Lord, what an interesting title. Well, why would a Roman centurion, the one in power, the one in authority, call a Jewish rabbi from really nowhere, a guy who had never written anything, hasn't written any songs from obscurity in history? Why would he call him Lord? It was because he saw something in Jesus. He saw that thing behind the thing that really is the answer to this messed up world. It's love. And he knew if anyone could help him, it would be Jesus. And so he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Again, this is astonishing. Why would he care about a servant? Servants in that day were property. They weren't people. They weren't human beings. And we do the same thing. That the problem with trying to label everybody and to find out our label and identify ourselves as a label is that that's an exclusive reality. Jesus is about to show us that, no, you're a human being. That's what you are. Created in the image of God. You're not boxed in, penned down, captive to some label, maybe a mistake you made in the past or some situation you find yourself in. You're valuable. So the centurion actually cares for this servant. And Jesus said to him, well, shall I come and heal him? You really want to move the heart of God? Then you show the compassion of God. And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Now, at first glance, it seems like he's being really humble, but I actually think he's trying to protect Jesus. Because if Jesus goes into a centurion's home who were considered pagans, that wasn't a good word, pagans by the Jews, it would have been a scandal. Jesus wasn't allowed to go. But what I love about Jesus is that he always puts relationship ahead of the rules. Yes, we need rules, I'm sure, but relationship always wins. Love always wins. It trumps everything else. If you're not sure what to do in a situation, choose the loving way. And so he says, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. I, I know how this works, for I myself am a man under authority and soldiers under me. I tell this one, go and he goes, and that one, come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. That, that word, amazed, is not strong enough in English. In the original language, it's to be almost like your breath taken away. Jesus is amazed a few times in the Bible, and it's often by people you didn't expect. So there's all kinds of people who follow the rules, but they don't know the thing behind the thing, so they just mimic. They just copy they follow blindly because they don't know the thing behind the thing. But the centurion demonstrates it. And Jesus is amazed. And then he says something really offensive. He says, Truly I tell you, I've not found anyone, any one of you rule keepers, any one of you who show up at church every week, I've never found anyone with such great faith. Don't get mad at me. Jesus said it. I say to you, that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. People you didn't expect. People you thought were on the outside when you thought you were on the inside. But the subjects of the kingdom who don't get the thing, who don't know what love is, will be thrown outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This isn't a threat, it's a reality. When you don't walk in the way of love, this is the only alternative. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go. Let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that 
moment. I don't know about you, but there are times I really get tired of this messed up world. Usually it starts with me when I've done something I shouldn't have done or in a moment of some kind of emotion, I did something that I deeply regret. You know what it's like, right? To wake up the next morning and to look in the mirror and go, what is wrong with you? I get tired of my frailty my lack to be sometimes the husband I'm supposed to be or the dad or the friend or the pastor. And like you, I feel broken inside for the mess that I have created. Others, other times I get tired of the chaos that other people create for me. Here's what I've learned about people. We create chaos and then we invite others into it. And it's just not good because things get hurt in the chaos. And I get sucked into your expectation of what I should be or how I failed you or how I disappointed you. What I should have been and couldn't have been. And I get tired. I get, I get tired of the mess in the world. I, huh, how many wars are we going to have to go through before we stop fighting each other? How, I, I know we try to justify it and explain it away, but... How many famines are we going to have to go through before we realize, you know, there's a better way. If we just shared our resources, we could all eat. What, what's it going to take? And the reason that I put my hope and my trust in the way of Jesus is because his answer, I believe, it's the way of love. That when we're willing to die to ourselves, and as hard as that is, that the solution is God's love. And so Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And behind these, this simple statement that mo most of us could probably quote are three key principles, things behind the thing. And the first one is that every human being has incredible value. I, I don't know your story, maybe. I don't know if you're watching online, maybe, maybe we've never met. But I do know that we all have heartbreak and we all have disappointment. And I know that we're all tempted to believe that we're on the outside looking in and that our value has been eroded from underneath of us because of that mistake, because of that label. But I'm here to tell you the truth that God doesn't see your mistake or your failure. He sees you. And you were created in the image of God. You have incredible value. You are not some label. You're a human being. And Jesus sees that. And so the challenge for you is to believe that first, but then also to express that. So can I ask you just a really hard, thought-provoking question right now in your life? Who are you fighting against that actually God is calling you to fight for? The answer is really simple. Whoever you're fighting against is who you're supposed to be fighting for. That's what Jesus did with the centurion, the enemy, the threat. That's what Jesus did with a servant and nobody. That's what he wants to do for you and for me so that we can be transformed to do it for others. And the second thing behind the thing is that we're better when we serve one another. Jesus has moved in this unique relationship. Like who in a story would write a centurion, an enemy of the state, a Jewish rabbi from nowhere, and a servant that nobody even knows their name. And yet these three in conjunction create healing. God heals in that context. I studied it because I was interested deeply in this. Jesus never works in isolation. Never. I challenge you, look it up. It's always in relationship that God works. And so it's when we cooperate and we use our power to serve that we're at our best. So not only who are you fighting against that you actually need to fight for today, but the second question is, who are you serving? This week, we kind of teased you with a, a special guest that was going to uh, make an appearance today. And so today, that's going to happen. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't unable because of the charity work that he does around the world to be here in person. So we went to him and we captured his story on, on video. And his name is Nav Batia. 
And maybe you, many of you know him as a super fan. He, he's the guy who uh, became famous during the run with the Raptors because he sits in the front row. He's not missed a single game of the Raptors, 960 regular season games. He's never missed a playoff game, 50 of them, and hopefully more to come. Uh, but, but Nav did something that inspired me. When he was uh, going to Milwaukee, a Milwaukee Bucks fan tweeted out an incredibly hateful racial slur. And this isn't new to Nav. He, he's experienced it most of his life here in North America because he chooses to wear a turban and he's maybe different than what some think is appropriate or right, whatever. But Nav did something really inspiring. He, he decided not to return hate with hate, but instead he took this fan out for dinner. And in so doing turned an enemy into a friend. So inspired were we by his story that we thought we could maybe learn something from him. And so here is that interview. Honored to meet you, Nav, and thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, today we're hoping to kind of just talk a little bit about your life. And I know that I've become a fan over the last couple of years, and I think our nation's been inspired by you and the way that you've just conducted yourself, the way you've made the world a better place. And so thank you so much for... And thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's great. So I wanted to start with just talking about, maybe for people who don't know you, talk to us a little bit about your story, how you came to Canada, how you became a super fan. I know it hasn't been an easy road, but why don't you just talk a little bit about your journey to Canada? From I know well, you grew up in India. And I so come from India, you know, and I came during 1984, during a very, very dark period in Indian history, uh, that was the time, as you know, I'm a Sikh by religion. Yeah. And uh, that was the time in 84 when there was a genocide going on mm. in India and the Sikhs were being, mass, uh, you know, uh, murdered. Yeah. And uh, there was no safe uh, heaven for Sikhs in their uh, houses or in the temple. Mm. And our businesses were being destroyed. And uh, it was a sort of a very dark time yeah. and a sad time yeah. for, uh, a humanity. Mm. So that's the time when we decided as a family to move to Canada. Mm. And uh, me and my wife were the first one to come to Canada. And then rest of my family during the following 10 years, they right. followed me around because it takes time to yeah. get all the things done in a proper way and all that. But I was here and you know what? I'm a mechanical engineer by education. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't easy to get a job as a, I, I got my first apartment in Morton for $350. Happiest guy on the earth. Yeah. You know, the safest place in the world, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but finding a job though was a very tough one. I couldn't find a job as a mechanical right. engineer, so. Based I, on how you look. Yeah, how I look, right. you know, and, uh, uh, but you know what? God takes care of it. Mm. You know, when you believe in something, yeah. you, you know, they, that Almighty takes mm. care of you and they shows you the ways, keeps you how to keep patient and how to treat people. And I was successful there, but I think the main thing was I treated everybody mm. like I wanted to be treated right. myself. Okay, I want to ask you a little bit about this and you've talked online a little bit about it as well, but you coming to Canada, you talked about experiencing some of the comments, things that people mm -hmm. have said, often racist, yeah. all the way to... You know, even this last season, the thing that everyone was talking about was this tweet from the, this Bucks fan. And I want to talk about this from your response because you respond with weapons that most people don't, and that's the weapons of love. Oh. And I want to talk about what motivates that for you because most people don't live like you do. I don't know if you know that, but on Twitter especially, yeah. most people don't respond like you do. Yeah. The, you know, sometimes when people, there is a fear of unknown. Sure. And we need to, and once they know it, mm. They love you. That's true. And that's with anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, we might see a people of a different color, or we see a uh, Muslim guy, or we see a mm -hmm. uh, Sikh guy, or we see a anybody we see. If we don't know, there's a little fear. Mm -hmm. I, I always say, I challenge everybody. Mm -hmm. You know what? Leave your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Go where you're not welcome. Yeah. But you do it with the weapon you're talking about, love. Yeah and you will see the world becoming a better place. It's true. In the basketball world, we talk a lot about the greatest of all times. We talk about the goats, we call them, right? 
uh, in, in your opinion, what is it that makes someone great? Because again, we, we have a lot of people that are part of our community that mm. are all, I think all of us really are wanting to be great in one way or another. We want to live great lives. What is it, do you think, that makes us great? Okay, to me, I think I, I will lead it a little bit now from yeah. this, you know, I'm not, I'll give you an example. To me, Vince Carter, mm. yeah, people think he was the best dunker of all time. Right. Michael Jordan, the greatest of all time mm. in basketball, Kobe Bryant. Mm. To me, it's not how many points they have scored or how many dunks they have done. Mm -hmm. I always say Vince Carter is the best because I saw him reaching out to the kids. Mm. We used to do a camp every year for 600 kids. Yeah. Where he used to spend his own time, a lot of money mm. to teach these kids, not just to play basketball, but the discipline of life. Mm. You know, it doesn't impress yeah. me right. if somebody's a billionaire or this. Yeah. Just tell me how many kids he has inspired. That's it. For me, that's the greatest part. That's the greatest, that's the greatest part. Hmm. I love it. Okay, one last thought for you. I want to know, anyone who's watching right now who, maybe they're thinking, I want to I live a great life. I want to change how I've been living. I've been living for myself, and I want to... I've been inspired by your story. What would you say to them? Uh, they're saying, I want to I want to start living my life maybe in the way that you've, in a lot of ways, conducted yourself. What a would full you life. You know, you're talking about a life, you know? Yeah. What More would you than say a, to them? Well, reach out to somebody whom you don't even know and they need help. Mm. Reach out to them mm. without anything in return. No strings. No strings attached. Mm. Just do it. If somebody's down, pick them up. Yeah. And then let the God, you know, this, God this. sorted out. <laughs> sort out the rest. Just do your thing. Yeah. And I tell you one thing. I assure you one thing. I guarantee you one thing. Mm. You will be more contented inside. If I'm living for a day or if I'm living for 10 years or I'm living for 20 years, I hope God helps me. And I'll tell all the people who are watching, when they go to the churches and pray, keep me in your prayers mm. to give me the strength to continue to do this. We will do that. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Appreciate and anytime it. I can do anything, yes. please let me know. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. And so just like Jesus was amazed at the centurion, we too were amazed that when love is truly exhibited, demonstrated, it is a truly beautiful thing, isn't it? So the challenge for us this morning is, who are you fighting against that God is actually challenging you to fight for? For that's what love requires. The second question is, who are you serving? Who in your life have you decided, determined to die to yourself so that they could be better, so that you could serve them, whether they're in a time of need or they don't even know they need something? For this is what love mandates. And so the final question is what is driving your life? What principles or guidelines are you following? Because here's what I've learned about life. If you don't know the answer to that question, you get nowhere. Or even worse, you get to a place you don't want to be. And so the centurion said to Jesus, if you say it, I believe it. And the response of Jesus is go because it will be done just as you have believed. How do you receive this love? Because you can't express what you haven't experienced. And the reason that we connect every week here is to be reminded that there's a God who's fighting for us, not against us. A God who served us by coming into this world and dying on a cross so we could be free of the shackles of sin, the things that hold us back. A God who gave us a way to follow. And the way to follow isn't a rule book, it's a person. The thing behind the thing is Jesus. And the way that you receive it is by just receiving his grace. This is the weirdest part of the whole story is that you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. There's nothing you could do for it. But simply receive it. We call it amazing grace. Grace is unmerited favor. 
when we were lost and broken and trampled down by life, God stepped in and said, I'll pick you up if you trust me. And if you follow me, I'm going to show you a better way to live, the way of love, so that we could together imagine a world, a world the way God designed it to be, of harmony. So if you're here today, and maybe you don't know this love, I'd love to just give you the opportunity to receive it. Say, how do I do that? Just like the centurion, you come to Jesus and say, Lord, help me. I don't know your story, but I do know that you don't have to leave this place the same way you came in. I don't know your story watching online, but I know that right now, God can do a miracle in your life too. That he sees you. He died for you so you could receive it. And maybe here and you have experienced this, but if you're honest, you haven't been living in it. May today be a reminder that we have been called not just to receive this love, but to live in it. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it costs us everything. Yes, we have to die to ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him, but it's the only way that the world is gonna be changed. So our challenge is to walk in this amazing grace. And so we're gonna give you a moment to respond however you want, as we sing a traditional hymn, a hymn that most of you will know, whether you come to church a lot or not, it's our opportunity to receive God's amazing grace, whether you need it for yourself or you need it for someone else today. May we begin this new season of our life living in the surrendered way of God's amazing love. Let us sing amazing grace together. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want us all to say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, this morning, our desire for you is to win. And we know that the only way that you can win is to not only experience this kind of love that Jesus came to give us, but to also express it. And so if you've come into this place and there's something stirring inside of you, something you know you need to deal with, could I encourage you to talk to the person you came with or at the front of this, at the end of their experience today will be a team that would love to pray with you. Or you can go to the great big blue wall and just ask somebody, what should I do next? And we'll help you. We're, we're not perfect. We don't have it all figured out. But we'll at least invite you on this journey. If you're watching online, just interact with our online pastor. But maybe for many of you, it'll be just making a commitment over the next four weeks to come and learn more about the greatest of all time, Jesus. The one who came to save us and to save this world. For this world was not designed to be this way, but God promises that he will make all things new. And the way that's gonna happen is when we dig deep into this love, 
we live it, we believe it. This is the hope of the world. And it's not a philosophy, it's not a religion, it's not an idea, it's a person, and his name is Jesus. And so today, I bless you with the truth that no matter how far you've fallen, there's a God who loves you. No matter what label or mistake or regret you carry, there's a God who loves you. But there's a God who loves you too much to leave you that way, that he's willing to step into your life and begin something new, birth something new inside of you so that you can learn to live in love. So may you, like the centurion, come hungry to God and say, I need this kind of love. Show me. And may you experience it so that you can express it everywhere you go this week, in your homes and in your schools, in your neighborhoods, in your places of work, at the counter at Tim Hortons and in the places you don't want to be. May love win the day, for this will change the world in Jesus' name. I bless you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.